The Japanese government says low levels of radiation are floating toward Tokyo after explosions rocked a nuclear power plant. KTLA's Frank Bugley traveled to the devastated city of Sendai and saw that damage firsthand. He joins us now via Skype from Akita. Frank, what's the latest? Well, we are in Akita, Chris, because of the uh, radiation uh, levels that you talked about. Out of uh, an abundance of caution, uh, we evacuated uh, Sendai earlier today uh, voluntarily and uh, drove to, to where we are right now, about 150, 160 miles away. It took about four hours, five hours to get here. Prevailing winds at the time from Fukushima had the winds moving in the direction of uh, Sendai. While we were there, though, we were able to get our first uh, look at the devastation there in Sendai. Here's a look. Cleanup effort is underway here in the city of Sendai, and there is much cleanup to do. Take a look at this right here. This is the Wakabayashi Ward of Sendai, where tsunami waters piled up debris. This is where cars and homes and lives were upturned by the force of the tsunami. The ruins here and for miles beyond, a surreal scene of destruction that seems to go on forever. Amid the ruins, signs of the life being lived in this community until the churning waters push through. When you get up close to this uh, pile of debris here in the Wakabayashi Ward, you see exactly how high it is. I'm six feet tall. It stands much taller than I am. And as you walk along and look at the individual items, one can't help but think, as you see an SUV like this one, whether someone was inside that SUV when the tsunami hit. The men working to clear out the debris don't know the answer. I asked this man if anyone could possibly be alive under all that debris, and he said it wasn't likely, but he does believe there are bodies buried underneath it. Indeed, just a few minutes later and a couple of miles away, we were with Japanese Self-Defense Force soldiers when they found the body of an unidentified woman. They found at least two other bodies in this neighborhood alone. The grim task of finding the missing, one that may go on for weeks given the amount of area to be searched, a mountain of pain ahead of a community already suffering. So that's what we found in uh, Sendai uh, earlier uh, today. Well, yeah, earlier today here in, uh, in uh, Japan. It's uh, approaching uh, midnight here in Japan. Uh, uh, it, it just complete scenes of devastation right now. We are in uh, this community, Akita, which is, again, about 150 miles north of Sendai. The uh, concern about uh, radiation and fallout, uh, very real for uh, all of us uh, in Japan uh, tonight. Uh, tomorrow, we were planning to go to Tokyo. We're going to reassess uh, when we uh, wake up in the morning to see if that's the, the most sensible thing to do. And uh, we'll let you know as we make our decisions. Chris. All right, thank you so much, Frank. Stay with KTLA and KTLA.com for continuing coverage of the disaster there in Japan. Of course, we'll speak to the hardworking Frank Buckley again in the 9 o'clock hour. Meanwhile, rescue teams in Japan say there is little hope of finding anyone alive under the rubble from the earthquake and tsunami. KTLA's Frank Buckley is in Japan and surveyed the wreckage in Sendai. <laughs> Japanese soldiers set out on their first search of this neighborhood of Natori, and within minutes, they found what they were looking for, a woman's body buried beneath the debris of fields full of debris. They found what they could amidst the mess to give the woman a final moment of dignity, a blanket wrapped around her before they carried her to the road. Hers was one of at least three bodies soldiers found in this neighborhood on this day. But it wasn't only humans that suffered in the tsunami. Here we found members of a horse club preparing a grave site for one of three horses killed when they were trapped in a stable as the waters rushed in. Nearly 20 horses have yet to be found. When you see the devastation up close, you get an appreciation of how much energy was behind the tsunami waves. This used to be a car of some kind. It's completely unrecognizable. And as we move along here through the path of the tsunami, look at this. This used to be a gas station, a service center, a car wash. It is now piled high with debris all the way up to the roof. Five days after the quake, the impact of the tsunami is everywhere. Fires are still smoldering. 
Days after the earthquake and the tsunami roared through this neighborhood of Natori, there's still a sense of urgency. Firefighters coming through with their sirens on as they search for survivors, search for the dead. They do what they can to put out the fires. They're helping soldiers and others as they look for survivors. It's another day of the grim work in the aftermath of a powerful earthquake and a deadly tsunami. And Frank Buckley will have another report from the hardest hit areas that will be tonight at 6 o'clock. And you can find the latest developments on the crisis in Japan on our website by heading to ktla.com slash Japan Wow, what a, a report from uh, Frank Buckley that really paints a picture of just how grim it is. So, yes, yeah, it, it must really be difficult. Does. One thing we can do, we're going to take you inside this store right here. It's called the Lawson. It's, it's almost like a 7-Eleven. A and we're going to walk you in uh, to, to show you what it's like here. One of the things that has happened is, as a result of, of what's happened in, uh, uh, in northeastern Japan, here in Tokyo, they've been affected by people who have sort of rushed the stores like this one. Again, Lawson, where we are, is, is kind of like a, a 7-Eleven. And just to give you a sense of, of what it's like uh, in, in this one particular store here in, uh, in the section of Tokyo we're in, We'll take you around to show you what the shelves look like. Uh, and this is one of the shelves right here. And if we can show you right here, it's they're completely empty, uh, this shelf. And I'm told that this has pretty much been the case since just after the quake hit on Friday. People went into the stores and they emptied out the shelves uh, in an attempt to make sure they had supplies. And then at the same time, the distribution networks have been cut down so people are not getting resupplied and restocked. So this is what people are facing in Tokyo, where we are, some 230 miles from the epicenter. Glennon, the share back to you. KTLA's Frank Buckley traveling through Japan tonight, filing reports on the devastation and the danger that still remains. Tonight, he shows us why he is leaving the affected areas for the Japanese capital. A taxi cab in Akita, Japan. Uh, we're about to uh, arrive at the airport here in Akita, and from here we plan to go to Tokyo. As you know, we came to Akita from Sendai, where we got our first-hand look at the devastation there. Uh, we came to Akita because of concerns about radiation fallout. We wanted to make sure we were outside of the danger zone. We believe that we are, but now we want to head back to uh, and, and that radiation from the Fukushima plant, as you know. We now want to head back to Tokyo because there are also concerns there. There have been concerns about potential radiation fallout. Experts saying that there's nothing in the air that would actually harm people in the immediate term. Still, there has been panic buying in the supermarkets, people buying emergency supplies. The stock market has plunged. We're going to go to Tokyo and check it out for ourselves. That's where we will report next. In Akita, Japan, I'm Frank Buckley, KTLA 5 News. Micah, back to you. The Japanese government says radiation levels at a damaged nuclear power plant are fluctuating by the hour. 24 hours ago, they increased, and that's caused alarm in the capital and forced air travelers to avoid the city. Others are getting out, and some governments are telling their citizens to leave the country. KTLA's Frank Buckley and his team are at one of the international airports there in Tokyo where they're getting ready to leave. And my understanding, Frank, is a lot of people are doing exactly what you're doing. Well, it's, it's, Chris, it's hard to quantify whether or not it's a lot of people who are doing what we're doing, but the people are making their individual decisions about whether or not to leave Japan. But you just mentioned that uh, the foreign governments have uh, suggested that some citizens leave the country. France and Australia specifically uh, issued those advisories for its citizens today, unlike the U.S. advisory, which suggests that uh, Americans shouldn't visit Japan right now uh, from the State Department. That's their advisory. France and Australia suggested that its citizens who are already in Japan leave. Uh, that's what we're doing after these uh, developments that Lynette had talked about today, specifically another fire at the uh, Fukushima uh, nuclear power complex and the evacuation of work there, a uh, brief evacuation, but still uh, they left uh, only a, a, a few of their uh, workers behind for a while. A helicopter tried to make a, a water drop uh, over one of the reactors as they try to keep the uh, fuel rods cooled down and it had to actually abort its mission. So, you know, a number of developments on the uh, radiation front to keep is keeping folks jittery. I, I just talked to a fellow passenger here in line who really, I thought, uh, put it well. This passenger uh, saying to me that it's hard to interpret 
uh, all this information that's uh, coming at you. And so it was uh, difficult to, to decide, but uh, he decided to go ahead and leave for a week, even though he works here, because he just uh, felt that it was uh, the sensible thing to do. Uh, Lynette also talked about uh, some of the devastation. We want to show you some of our pictures of Sendai, where uh, we were uh, just a couple of days ago. And what we saw there was tremendous devastation, and the death toll rising around 4,000 now. Uh, damages to Japanese output uh, is it, uh, estimated to be 125 to 200 billion dollars. Uh, uh, it, it is a country that is uh, on edge uh, tonight uh, and a country that uh, has a long way to go in terms of recovery. Chris, back to you.